Hello everybody, you're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news, we have a different guest on each week, we head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry, we head over to the Yorkshed each week for an album review from Twangling Jack Ford, and we play local, unsignedsigned and or independent music. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for the Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. We're repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights, we're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. We have a Facebook page, if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I particularly want to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with MP3s, people with stories to share. Don't hesitate to get in touch. So this week we are going to have another Twanglin' Jack album review special, because we have a lot of them to get through. But before we do that, we're going to head over to the Rye Light Zone, and uh, we are going to listen to the latest part of formerly The Rise and Fall of a Social network so this is a novel by myself Dane Cobain we've been re- uh, we've been serializing it in recent shows so if you've missed an episode you can listen on catch up it's also available as an audio book an ebook and a paperback wherever good books are sold and also on Amazon so this is formally the rise and fall of a social network chapter 8 Christmas was a quiet affair for the first time in years Sarah and I didn't see each other she went to stay with her family but I had no time for mine I spent most of the holidays working on the front end and drinking cheap lager in front of the TV. I know that doesn't sound like much, but it was good enough for me. I didn't even realise it was New Year's Eve until the fireworks started to go off. An exhausted end to a busy year. We were officially back in the office on the 2nd of January. John and Peter were reluctant to give us the bank holiday, but they hadn't had much of a choice. I went in there anyway to get out of the flat, but I was the only one there other than the two founders, and I left early because their occasional arguments drove me crazy whenever Flick wasn't around. She seemed to have a calming, neutralising effect on the group. We needed it the following day. John ordered yet another team meeting and then erupted as soon as we were all together. Guys, just a heads up, he scowled. The flat was broken into last night while we were sleeping. Luckily the sight of Kerry on the sofa was enough to scare them off. We were just lucky he was still awake. That man will sleep through anything. Thanks, boss, Kerry grinned. John didn't look amused. Indeed. It looks like sometimes you do have your uses. Listen, guys, we need to double down on security. Don't bring anyone to the office unless you trust them. Flick, that goes for journalists too. Oh man, she murmured. You gotta be kidding me. This place is one of our greatest assets. Where do you expect me to take them? Take them out for a coffee or a bite to eat, John replied. Our budget can stretch to that, just about. Keep it locked down tight at home too. We don't know who they were or what they were looking for, but we can take a good guess. A lot of people would like to see us fail. John. Elaine said, holding out a hand for silence. The two founders respected Elaine for her financial brains, if not for her entrepreneurial spirit, and they always had time for her. Don't you think you're being paranoid? You should report it to the police. I don't want the police sniffing around here, he replied. We keep things private, that's just how we roll. As for being paranoid, I don't know. I'm just very aware that our servers contain a hell of a lot of sensitive data. People would kill to get at it. No more working from home either. Everything stays on Peter's servers. The development team groaned in unison. We all knew what that meant. Here was a job that you could never complete inside of hours, and now we couldn't even work from home. This was going to mean a lot of long evenings at the office. I know, John said, spreading his hands defensively. It's not ideal, but our hands are tied. Real folks, just make sure you keep it tight and everything will be fine. We're getting some help in too. Peter's got a friend who specialises in security, and we trust him. We're going to see about bringing him in. Until then, all other hires are on hold. That's all for now. Let's get back to work. Peter flew back the following day. John got hold of him on the phone when he was making his way through passport control, and he wasted no time in telling him about the break-in. In a panic, Peter jumped straight into a cab at the airport and travelled directly to the office, where we'd ordered pizza to celebrate his return. He wolfed down a couple of slices, wiped the grease from his hands and walked straight into the cramped boardroom for a private meeting with John. The two founders never told us what they talked about, but I had a pretty good guess. Over the next couple of days, Peter worked around the clock to move the servers to a new, more secure location, one that was reliable and unlikely to cause any downtime. Even John wasn't to know where they were. Peter claimed to have found a way to store them with complete anonymity, referring to it as a temporary fix until our new head of security could join us. But even with the servers stored securely in some mysterious lockup in the middle of nowhere, the founders weren't happy. Then, one gloomy Thursday afternoon, Abby took me aside to tell me he was thinking about leaving the company. I just can't keep up, he said. 
My wife is upset because I don't spend any time with her. And now we have a child on the way. Wow, congratulations, I said, wrapping my arms around his shoulders. Inwardly, I felt the pity that comes naturally to the childless when they secretly wonder why all of their friends are having children when it's such an inconvenience. Thanks, he replied. You're the first person I've told. John would tell me I'm crazy. That depends on what you've got lined up after formally, and on when you're planning on leaving. We'll be in a lot of trouble without you. I know. You're stuck with me for a while yet. I told Sonal to give me it until after the birth to take paternity leave so I can look for a new job. And you think your leave will be granted? I asked. Hell no. But whatever. You understand that this conversation never happened, yes? Of course, I replied. Your secret's safe with me. I seem to be saying that a lot of late. Peter became unbearable after the break-in. He insisted that someone needed to be at both the office and the flat at all times, which was both insane and impractical. It meant that Kerry had to stay at the flat and work from there, while John had to sleep at the office. When John was away, Flick and I took in sleeping bags and kept each other company through the long, dark nights. But not in that way. Aside from our drunken kiss at the end of the previous year, Flick and I stayed as friends and split the duty of guarding the office so that neither of us was ever left alone amidst the hum of the computers. One night, as we lay there in the boardroom, I heard a noise from outside the office. I couldn't sleep, and Flick lay wide awake beside me on the hardwood floor. What was that? she whispered. I cursed softly and wrapped my hands around the baseball bat that John had ordered me to sleep beside. You heard it too? Damn, that means I'll have to check it out. My voice was husky and half muffled with exhaustion, but Flick was shrill and full of adrenaline. She grabbed my wrist and stared urgently into my eyes. Be careful out there, she said. Don't get yourself hurt. Thanks, I replied, for staying positive. I'm serious, Dan. Formally need you. I need you, you idiot. Don't worry. I'll be back, I told her. I promise. She smiled reassuringly as I wriggled out of my sleeping bag and shuffled towards the door. The noises seemed louder now. I could make out a couple of different voices from the alleyway outside and they didn't sound friendly. I scouted out the office and saw nothing, so I sidled over to the window, opened it slowly and poked my head out into the cool night air. From here I could see them clearly, silhouetted by the streetlights. There were three of them, riding on bicycles with scarves around their necks to disguise their faces and to keep them warm in the bitter weather. I watched them for a couple of seconds, for long enough to figure out that they were digging through our bins in search of something, and then remembered that I was supposed to be defending the place. I flipped, partly because Flick was watching me from the boardroom, and I shouted at them from the safety of a second floor window. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? The youths looked up at me and they laughed en masse. Then one of them broke off from the group and launched a projectile at the window. The glass shattered on impact, and I fell backwards under the assault, brushing broken glass off my tracksuit bottoms. I cursed under my breath and then stepped gingerly through the glass in my bare feet so that I could lean through the window again. The youths had bottled it, and they were already on their bikes and halfway down the alleyway. Get back here right now, I bellowed, secretly hoping they'd ignore me. You little sh But it was too late. They were out of sight in a matter of seconds. I was glad. It didn't take much to shout at people from the safety of a building, but I didn't want a confrontation. I was just glad that they were gone, and that I'd save face in front of Flick. I made my way back to the boardroom and climbed into my sleeping bag. Flick was already in there, waiting for me. We didn't get much sleep that night, what with one thing and another, so we were both glad when Abby arrived the following morning. A light rain had filtered in through the broken window and left discoloured patches on the carpet. Shards of broken glass were scattered across a six-foot square, and the offending object had bounced across the room and stumbled to a halt in front of the beanbags. I'd examined it earlier that morning, some sort of tinned food with a label removed. I thought I'd better leave the scene as it was in case John wanted to see it. Knowing him, he probably would. It was as cold as hell in the winter when the fires go out, and even with multiple layers of clothing, we were still freezing. We turned the heating up as high as it would go, but the cold wind blew in from outside and circulated through the office. But there wasn't much that we could do. John would want to see the scene before he decided what to do with it. When Abby arrived, he took one look around the office and collapsed into his chair. What happened? he asked. Good question, I growled. We were attacked in the middle of the night. I tried to scare some kids who were going through the bins. It didn't turn out so good. I can see that, he replied. What will the boss say? Who cares what John says, Flick scowled. Her eyes were dark with lack of sleep, but she seemed stronger now and in charge of the situation. If he'd been here, then Dan wouldn't have had to deal with it. 
He's just going to have to tap those investors for some cash for a new window. And have you called the police? Of course not, I replied. You heard what the boss said. He doesn't want them poking around. No, if he wants to call the cops, he can do it himself. John came back later that afternoon. He took the news surprisingly well. At least they didn't get in here, he said, booting up his laptop and settling down at his workstation. And we don't throw out our paperwork, we burn it. You guys have been running a tight ship, so thanks for that. But who were they? asked Abby. And what did they want? Are you sure that we're safe here? Abby, we're just off one of the busiest streets in the city and we've kitted the place out like a fortress. You're safer here than you are at home. I disagreed. You say that, but no one's throwing tinned food at my bedroom window, boss. Abby's got a point. John thought for a moment before making his decision. Okay, he said. You win. We'll call in some reinforcements. We'll sign the deal with Peter's friend's security firm. Your safety is paramount to the success of the site. I'm not going to lie. We need you. That was an excerpt from formerly the rise and fall of a social network by myself, Dane Cobain. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, and this is Radio Generation with their version of Gene Genie.
Away by Jazz Dylan, and before that, we had Gene Genie by Radio Generation. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the Elk Shed to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album reviews for our album review special. 10cc, the best of 10cc. 10cc were a very confusing act. Three of them had been hot legs who had a novelty hit with Neanderthal Man. A song we chanted at school like a football chant. A song so simple it was decades ahead of its time. Of those three, one had been a 60s pop star and had built a recording studio. The other member of 10cc had been a very successful songwriter writing hits for the Hollies, Herman's Hermits and the Yardbirds. 10cc's first hit, a song called Donna, was almost teeny bop. Another of their early hits was The Dean and I, which seemed to be a Doris Day 50s rom-com of a song. They had a very successful song called Rubber Bullets, which was a 50s style rock and roll pastiche that poked fun at jailhouse rock and remarkably had the line, we've all got balls and brains, but some's got balls and chains. Other hits included the very jokey Life is a Minestrone, the Wall Street Shuffle and the worst band in the world with the non-rhyming joke that everyone got. We're the worst band in the world of that we will admit. We're the worst band in the world and we don't give up. That song is not on this album. Their songs had very sharp witty lyrics like cliches and toupees and three pays and the music came in all kinds of styles even the simple songs had several different sections with changes of style and tempo. Their third album verged on being prog rock with a very lengthy concept piece called One Night in Paris, which was grand and operatic and in three movements, but was still quite funny. Which is how the croissant crumbles after all. Up to a point they were an arty comedy band with the versatility of bands like Queen or Yes, with the Beatles-like sense of melody and musical adventure, and with the humour of the Bonzos or Randy Newman. 
I saw them at Hammersmith Odeon where they faithfully recreated the songs, including one which featured the device they had pioneered called the gizmo. It was a way of playing sustained notes on the guitar like an ebo on each string. The gizmo appeared on a number of records, notably Liverpool Lou by The Scaffold. The final song in their live set was Rubber Bullets with ended with a guitar workout that a band like Status Quo might have climaxed with. Eventually they split with two of them becoming video pioneers in the MTV age and the other two continuing to make amusing, catchy, clever pop songs like I'm Mandy, Fly Me, a cheerful song about a plane crash with the line I've often heard that jingle, it's never struck a chord. They made a few straight up no nonsense classic love songs like The Things We Do For Love and some more comedy with Good Morning Judge and Dreadlock Holiday. On another one of their hits they made fun of art for art's sake. But this is not art for art's sake. It's the best of 10cc. Billy Joel, the ultimate collection. The way I feel about Billy Joel is a bit like the way I feel about Elton John. I admire them immensely but there is not a lot of their output that I actually like. I don't even have an Elton John compilation, though I think he is a great pianist and songwriter. I just don't like his singing. With Billy Joel, my problem is over-familiarity, but Just The Way You Are is not the kind of song I would ever like, even if it was not played to death by Joel himself and numerous cover artists. Uptown Girl is very clever in the way he captured the sound of the 60s vocal groups, but I've just heard it too many times. Piano Man is a great song, well-crafted lyrics, excellent piano accompaniment, but I hear it all the time, usually played on a guitar. I remember liking Still Rock and Roll to me back in the days when we all wore skinny ties and wanted to be exploited by the music business. And I remember absolutely loving We Didn't Start the Fire. But once you get used to the clever use of meter and rhyme, it starts to sound a bit like a shopping list. I would definitely recommend River of Dreams, Innocent Man and the sublime She's Always a Woman to Me. One of his songs that would make me buy a Billy Joel album. I do really like Until the Night from the album 52nd Street which would be one of Springsteen's greatest songs if he had written it. I also love scenes from an Italian restaurant, but this double CD is so chock full of Billy Joel favourites, neither of these songs are included. Obviously I would have had no trouble dropping songs to make space. I'm also a big fan of Say Goodbye to Hollywood, though I prefer the version Ronnie Spector recorded with the E Street Band. The other songs I particularly like are the ones that feature characters. The US Marines in Good Night Saigon, his Vietnam War epic, and the story of the sad clown keeping the children happy in his Cold War epic Leningrad. The lyrics tend to say everything that needs to be said without too much unnecessary embellishment. The clever thing about Billy Joel is that he is such a self-contained performer. Like Elton John, the heavy lifting is all done by his piano playing, but in the epic pieces he employs every musical trick to get his point across, to tug at your emotions. Like a film soundtrack, the strings tend to be less smaltzy than on the love songs, and more poignant. In Allentown we meet desperate characters living in a dead-end town that has lost its steelworks. We meet a man in an abusive relationship, living for Lena, and a failing fisherman in Nantucket. On this album he plays a duet in a minor key with Ray Charles. And in the end it is all about soul. Billy Joel. Agents of Fortune, the Blue Oyster Cult. I got this CD from the sweet charity charity shop in Prestwood for a pound. There had always been something cool about the Blue Oyster Cult. Amidst all the progressive rock epic excesses and bloated mid-70s adult orientated rock, they stood out as the acceptable face of heavy metal. Tracks just as long as they need to be to put the song across, carrying no excess weight. Very New York. Arty and ironic, 
with curious lyrics written by cool contributors like Patti Smith. They were musical dilettantes that could not resist the temptation to add big harmony backing vocals and jazzy piano. There were riffs, but somehow not quite that heavy. And they would rock and roll, like Led Zeppelin's rock and roll. There were solos, but they were not very distorted. And there was always a hint that there was something subversive about them with titles like Dominance and Submission. And that cult-like symbol suggesting something almost Masonic about Blue Oysters. There was always the distinct possibility that it was all a joke that those not in the cult were not clever enough to get. Song titles like Seven Screaming Disbusters and Hot Rails to Hell made it clear they wanted in on the heavy metal genre, but wanted to have fun playing with it and redefining it in their own image. They were deliberately preposterous, singing about cities on flame with rock and roll and lining up with all the members playing guitars including the drummer and keyboard player. I found their earlier studio albums a bit underproduced when compared to British heavy rock acts, but the track Astronomy from the album before this one is so good it almost made me consider recommending their greatest hits package. But I have chosen Agents of Fortune. The opening track was punk in sentiment and new wave in execution before anyone outside of New York knew about such things. This ain't the summer of love. It was an anthem for the late 70s. But this album will be best known for Don't Fear the Reaper. And we of the punk new wave power pop inclination loved that song, Cowbell and All. It is a song that truly crosses all genres. But Reaper was not even the highlight for me when I first heard the album. Even with its jangly guitar and its smooth melody. I was most impressed with the song ETI, Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It has the biggest riff on the album, a riff so big it can't even be diminished by the talk box. It has a big chorus that you would sing along to if you could make out the words. Other than that, it is only just a rock album. Not hard rock or metal or even heavy. It has songs, interesting songs, pop songs, Catchy hooks like True Confessions, a jokey song about a vampire, and it closes with a big showy number, with acoustic guitars, power chords, and choirs of vocal. You might call it a power ballad if you were the kind of rock fan who didn't think that calling it a power ballad would be an insult. Agents of Fortune. Blue Oyster Cult. Bon Jovi. Slippery When Wet. Before punk, I was quite a fan of heavy rock, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple. But after punk, the new wave of British heavy metal was like Vienna. It meant nothing to me. I played in a band that often supported new wave of heavy metal bands. And we lost a residency in Hammersmith to Iron Maiden. We would also do PA hires for metal bands at places like the Ruskin Arms. But I never again loved that music. But even I liked living on a prayer. I found the CD in the British Heart Foundation charity shop for two quid. But had I not been doing these recommendations, I would probably have left it there. I assumed I had heard all the best bits and I'm not even that keen on You Give Love a Bad Name. But I gave it a listen and I think it is a great collection of songs, well written, well played and very well sung. The fashionable production trends of the times do not intrude too much and even the voice box is sort of okay. It is certainly not as annoying as Peter Frampton's use of it on Show Me The Way. There is Wanted Dead or Alive, but you would expect a cowboy musician like me to like that. There are soaring guitar solos with lightning flurries of notes and whammy bar dive bombs and big vocal choruses. And the snare is not too loud and the digital synths are not too modulating. I heard a hard rock DJ commenting on the insane popularity of this album and saying that it did not reflect the genre. 
Listening to it now, I wonder if it more reflects Bon Jovi's home state of New Jersey. I can hear similarities to Springsteen and Southside Johnny, and one song that sounds very much like Little Stephen and the Disciples of Soul, which will do for me. Bon Jovi, Slippery When Wet. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Searching by John C. Buttigieg. That was Searching by John C. Buttigieg. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to head back over to the Ilk Shed for some more album reviews, courtesy of the one and only Twanglin' Jack Ford. The Stranglers, a collection, 1977 to 1982. The Stranglers were a pub rock band that got themselves lumped in with punk. And like all fellow travellers riding on coattails, they denied any comparisons and moved off in their own direction. Even by the exciting standards of the time, Grip, their first single, stood out. And what made it was the keyboard. Dave Greenfield's arpeggios invited comparisons to Ray Manzarek of The Doors. The swirling synths on Grip are indeed a bit like the intro to Light My Fire. But when you listen to further tracks, you will find organ solos in the style of John Lord of Deep Purple, and in places I'm reminded of Rick Wakeman's work with the Straubs. The Strangler's debut album was called Rattus Norvegicus, and it had a hint of the sewer about it. It is like being barked at close up by a seedy old man in a raincoat with halitosis. It contained a very unlikely hit, a cleaned up version of the song Peaches. They cleaned it up, but it remained grimy. Jean-Jacques Burnell's thunderous bass riff played like a blunt instrument and is sung like a dirty joke. They made a number of hit singles. They could be quite commercial but still sound as menacing as a ransom note or an offer you can't refuse. They took Bacharach and David's walk on by and turned it from a plaintive request into a forceful threat. The album version has a solo section similar to Light My Fire in which Dave Greenfield shows off his talents, 
and guitarist and singer Hugh Cornwell has a go but is no Robbie Krieger. These compilations tend to fizzle out towards the end, but the Stranglers ended their successful era with a couple of bangers. The last one is Strange Little Girl, a sweet song about alienation. And the other one is Golden Brown, a song about heroin in 5-4 time, with the languid feel of a lazy Sunday afternoon in mid-July. A very unlikely hit, but the one Stranglers song that is now considered a classic. The Stranglers, The Collection, 1977 to 1982. Welcome to the Canteen, a live album by Traffic. I have a number of the early Traffic albums and I find them to be quite inconsistent. They made some great singles in the 60s like Paper Sun, Here We Go Round the Mulberry Bush and even Hole in My Shoe. So generally I would recommend finding a compilation or cherry picking on a streaming service. They were at their best when the guitarist and songwriter Dave Mason was in the band. Welcome to the Canteen is a live album and is the last time Dave Mason played with Traffic. I have mentioned before an early evening radio programme on London's Capital Radio. It was called Your Mother Wouldn't Like It and was presented by Little Nicky Horn. I used to get seriously annoyed by the narrow playlist but they did often play the Traffic version of Give Me Some Lovin'. Give Me Some Loving is a brilliant piece of songwriting written mostly by a very young Steve Winwood when he was in the Spencer Davis group. It has the simplicity that a fledgling songwriter can effectively only use once. It is basically just a vamp on one chord with a rise of the kind you would expect to find on a stack soul record. It has been covered many times and is featured in the Blues Brothers film. It has even been recently used to advertise yoghurt. There is also a film of Traffic playing it at the original Glastonbury Fair. The Traffic version is extended with percussion and solos. I am not much of a fan of Winwood's singing which puts me in a bit of a minority and I don't particularly like his 80s hits like Valerie. But his singing and organ playing on Give Me Some Loving is just perfect. Added to that there is a hypnotic riff backed up by African percussion that plays through almost the whole thing. Welcome to the Canteen has decent versions of the traffic standards 40,000 Headmen and Medicated Goo and has two Dave Mason songs. There is also a really good extended version of Mr Fantasy, often regarded as a traffic classic. This features dueling lead guitars and is an indicator of how good they could have been if Mason and Winwood could have got along. Welcome to the Canteen. Traffic. The Travelling Wilburys. Roy Orbison had one of the finest voices in rock and roll, clear and sharp, melodious and pure. He was also a great and original songwriter. He had not been massively successful since the 60s, but he had recorded the song I Drove All Night with You Too, which had put him back in the public eye. So I was quite surprised when he teamed up with the four whiniest singers in rock and roll. I was never a fan of ELO after Roy Wood left but I did admire Jeff Lynne. At the start of the 70s, George Harrison may well have been the number one rock star in the world. Tom Petty made some of my favourite music of the late 70s and early 80s. Harrison, Petty and Lynne all had a certain Dylan-esque quality to their singing. That made it even more surprising when they teamed up with the real Bob Dylan. Orbison, Petty, Harrison, Lynne and Dylan became the Travelling Wilburys. Apparently a Wilbury is a recording error, as in, we'll bury it in the mix. The biggest surprise was that they released such a good album. Supergroups are notorious for underperforming, usually because each of the members saved their best material for solo projects. But the first single by the Wilburys remains to this day a classic, Handle Me With Care. It was apparently going to be a George Harrison B-side, yet it has to be one of his most memorable songs. It is one of the songs where all the singers got to go at being lead. The same is true of the other big song from this album, End of the Line, which is also extremely good. And there is plenty on the album that is as good, if not better, than each of the members was doing separately at the time.
The standard criticism of Bob Dylan is that he cannot sing, yet to me this album seems to see him at a peak, with his voice stronger than his younger voice, and not yet showing signs of ageing. At the time of this album, this was almost certainly the best thing he was doing. I would have expected it to be more Crosby, Stills and Nash, Laurel County, LA, Sunshine, Folky strumming, but the default sound seems to be more rockabilly. In places swampy and in other places Bo Diddley with sequenced synths. There are horn riffs, sax solos, Harrison's slide guitar, and a maddeningly catchy number that might be an attempt at Calypso or even High Life. The backing vocals are glorious, never unnecessarily repeating words, but always singing perfectly harmonious oohs and ahs. It should be remembered that Harrison did some of his best work singing in the background, with his Liverpudlian mates. The Orbison-led track is classic Orbison, and would sit well in any Orbison best-of package. The Jeff Lynne-led track reminded me a bit of the rock and roll nostalgia in the latter days of The Move, before the brummy wannabe California man became a real California man. They made another album after Orbison died, and they called it Volume 3. These were performers who could afford to play such jokes. Travelling Wilburys. Big thank you to Twangle and Jack Ford for this week's album reviews. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Maz Manzini with Witless.
That was Magic Circle by Sloth in the City, and before that we had Witless by Maz Manzini. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Hank Cobain. This is the part of the show where we'd normally head over to the Oak Shed to get an album review from Twanglin' Jack Ford, but this week has been an album review special. So we're going to skip that. Instead, we have the Any Other Business. So as always, you can listen to us again. We're repeated on Monday nights on Wickham Sound. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Uh, we have a Facebook page, The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. And you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. Don't hesitate to get in touch. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and this is the incredible Kit Goff with Freedom. I'll chat to you guys next week. Stand. Freedom, oh freedom, oh now freedom from my mind. Freedom, oh freedom, oh now freedom from my mind. Empathize and try to Right.